From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, we're diving into a story uh, that <laughs> that is going to be, in, in at least some respect, uh, familiar to all of us. Like most of our best suggestions, this came from one of your fellow listeners, from Bridget B., who reached out to us via social media to ask about the dark side of the fashion industry. Uh, Bridget, you specifically were asking us about one aspect of the fashion industry that we're, uh, no spoilers, gonna, gonna save for a later episode because we believe that when it comes to the occulted side of the story behind the clothing we all wear, uh, there's more than one episode's worth of stuff they don't want you to know here. And that's, that's kind of because, you know, uh, clothing is one of the fundamental needs of the human species. It's it's the shelter that you wear and you walk around in, uh, and you know I, I I think we can point out the um, the elephant or should I say the clothes source in the room here, guys. Uh, people are we're we're pretty smart, you know. We have our moments, uh, but we're very much a visually driven, appearance based creature, right? Yeah, you mean human beings. Right, uh, not not just the three of us. Right, I like that. I, like, I, I love the idea of us, the three of us, being a single creature. Like we form like Voltron, and we are a appearance based uh, creature. No, it's true. We are just like like everyone else. I mean, it's funny considering the times that we're living in. I think people have maybe gotten a little less concerned with their appearances. You know, people are doing Zoom calls in like workout shorts and you know, uh, kind of mussed up hair and stuff. But yeah, in the before times, absolutely, uh, appearance was everything. You know, you want to look. Smart smart and sharp when you go to a meeting or when you go out on the town. And, and that's what fashion is. It becomes like a, almost an extension of who we are as people. Um, the idea that, you know, the clothes make the man or whatever. Um, yeah, people really lean hard into personal style and uh, it really becomes kind of intertwined with our identities. Yes, it certainly does. And I would just say that now in times where we aren't going out as much, the act of getting ready for a day as though you were going to go out and dressing up as though you are going to an important meeting or something or going to meet with friends and taking that extra step to look really good. It, it has become this powerful thing that changes the the way we, we feel about ourselves in these times. And it, um, I, I was just speaking with my wife a little bit about that and how you know, if you're not going to be going out or doing anything, you generally don't have to think about that stuff. But when you do, it changes your entire outlook uh, for the day, the way you feel about yourself and the way you feel others would interact with you. It's just it, fashion and caring about appearance can be a powerful thing for oneself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. I mean, it's it, it gives lie to that old comfortable figure of speech where people would say, you know, oh, you can't judge a book by its cover. Well, my response to that would be, why do books have a cover? What's your beef with uh, graphic designers there? Uh, people, we do judge people by the clothing they wear, by their appearance, uh, because we all participate in this uh, social assumption that that is a statement a person is making. It's, it's the first version of a business card we see when we encounter someone. And it, it does, uh, you know, it is an opportunity to voice one's personal aesthetic. Uh, but at worst, it can also be a substitute for a personality. It can be, <laughs> right, it can become a means of confusing wealth with superiority, right? Whenever the new hot product comes out. Uh, it can even, in some cases, 
uh, such as uh, cockades during the time uh, leading to and following the Civil War, it can be a declaration of hate, right? Like sympathies with the Confederacy or, you know, in uh, maybe a fascist regime, a certain badge or armband can identify you. But, you know, regardless of where it falls on the spectrum, again, it's a fundamental need. We're a smart species, but we're not especially durable. And... <laughs> And this is, I don't know, this is something that's always been hilarious to me. Human beings are intelligent, right? Uh, But there are relatively few places in the world where a human being can live naked all year round. Whether you're a pauper or whether you're a Bezos, you, you probably have to wear clothes at some point in your life. So fashion, clothing, apparel, it's not going anywhere, but it has a dark side, a very deep dark side. Here are the facts. So why don't we start by, uh, let's kind of size up the fashion industry here a little bit. Um, in the U.S., uh, as some of the world's largest fashion companies are based in the U.S., uh, in 2017, the United States alone generated $115 billion American dollars in women's wear sales and about $86 billion in men's wear. Uh, in the U.S. alone, the Bureau of Labor estimates some uh, 1.8 million people are employed in the fashion industry, with 232,000 of those being in textiles, um, manufacturing fabrics uh, for different uh, apparel and other fashion items, accessories, etc. Um, average annual wages in fashion range from 26,440 bucks, be on the super low end, for textile bleaching and more procedural kind of factory type operations, dying machine operators, uh, to 84,600 bucks for folks in marketing and sales managing. For sure. And the Bureau of Labor also, you know, notes in here that there are a lot of discrepancies in how much people are paid. You know, you're, we're talking about averages, right? Um, about 79% of all U.S. employees in fashion work for some kind of apparel retailer. So somebody who is actually selling and distributing a bunch of clothing and accessories and things. And the annual average wage at one of those companies is just slightly higher, uh, around $26,650. However, where the real money is, uh, or well, at least the higher wages are, that's in sales managers, that's in the marketing side of this, this industry, people who are out there actually selling the stuff, uh, and people who are running the show, they have an annual wage of around eighty four thousand six hundred dollars. But I mean that that would still be on a, a relatively low side of the high side because I mean folks like fashion designers make like hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. But that is that's almost like if you're thinking about the fashion industry and those designers that roll in the big bucks, it's kind of like the NBA. If you think about all that's of a good the, point. Yeah. all the basketball players in the world. And yep. then the very few that make those ridiculous amounts of money, um, it's kind of like that. Yeah, it's like being discovered. It's like being a you know uh, a rock star. I mean, it really is, or or, or a movie star or something. Yeah. The uh, to clarify, when we're talking about apparel retailers, we're talking about everything from you know a Target where somebody might buy back to school clothes to something more higher end a boutique you would see at a shopping district or a mall uh, but but yes even even with the um, the rarefied air of guru designers aside there there's still marked market discrepancies here uh, accountants and auditors for instance receive an annual average pay of uh, just under seventy thousand dollars buyers and purchasing agents get paid on average fifty six point five thousand dollars a year something like that and and again you know in any industry of this size averages are going to be a little bit misleading because that that clearly means there are people who make north of a hundred thousand dollars as purchasing agents so if we dive into the discrepancies here we see that they only accelerate as we look at the macroeconomic picture, there are big, big, presumably well-dressed fish in this global pond. Uh, McKinsey, which is a super powerful, super opaque, 
probably kind of evil consulting firm uh, that uh, is a um, uh, a former employer of Pete Buttigieg, by the way. Uh, McKinsey estimated that 97% of the economic profits for the entire fashion industry are earned by a relatively small group of companies. Just 20 companies in the fashion industry uh, earn 97% of the profits. And most of those 20 companies, as you might assume, are in what we would call the luxury segment. They're also the majority of those 20 companies of that pantheon of, uh, of that pantheon of profitable fashion. Uh, most of them have been in the game for a while. 12 of those top 20 have been in that that upper echelon for the past uh, 10 years. And their names are probably, at least a few are very familiar to you, uh, regardless of where you live. Yes. And a lot of the, you know, kind of longstanding leaders in the space uh, include, uh, among many others, um, Ind- Inditex? I don't know Inditex. I think, that's, I think that's how you would say Inditex. LVMH and uh, Nike. Uh, which I know, Ben, you were a bit surprised by, um, which have more than doubled their economic profits over the past 10 years. Uh, and each of those companies racked up more than $2 billion bucks in economic profit in 2017. Um, and, you know, you got, we, we, we got to remember, too, that clothes at the end of the day are a uh, uh, one of those, you know, life necessities. Um, they are designed to help us survive um, and, you know, be warm and stay dry. Uh, but we also want to wear things that we like and we want to look cool while we're doing it. Let's uh, let's go into some more of these companies because we're talking about the ones we mentioned there, LVMH, Inditex and Nike, at least what, at least $2 billion, uh, not too shabby, right? But jump over to The Gap. You know the commercials. You've seen the one near you, wherever you live, because there's probably one somewhere around you. Uh, it was the top-selling retailer. It had sales of around $16.5 billion. That's a United States currency, by the way. Woohoo! Pretty, pretty great. Uh, then if you look at, you know, the... The Lexuses and the Infinities of the clothing brands get in that luxury line over there. You can check out the one we mentioned, LVMH. Um, is it Moet or Moe? Moe? I don't. Yeah. I honestly don't know. Moe. That sh- that's like that's champagne, right? Isn't that a alcohol brand? It's such a it's such a ridiculous story of. Uh, consolidation of corporate acquisitions right. so it, it's uh it, it's also hennessy louis vuitton it, it's this it's this gigantic luxury goods conglomerate it's let's just call it the good life corporation right that I, that's the lvmh correct yeah that's we're talking about louis vuitton moe hennessy that's lvmh just so for wow. everybody knows. It's uh, crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like, what else do they sell? Probably monocles. I mean, I guess monocles, uh, maybe, like, custom bath mats for mega yachts. I yeah, don't know. G- gilded bidets, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> perhaps. <laughs> yes. Uh, interesting. I mean, that's that's great. That's great for, great for LVMH. That's awesome. I, w- I want to just really quickly, just v- really quickly, we'll move right on, just chime in. There's also, we, t- we talked at the top of the show about like, you know, the idea of like uh, fashion being an economic indicator or a way to kind of, you know, flex and say, look at me, I have money. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of money on this stuff that don't have money. <laughs> And they just need to feel like they're keeping up with the Joneses and maybe like, you know, spending irresponsibly on like Gucci stuff because they want to be like, quote unquote, cool or like look like their favorite celeb who wears these brands. But it's really not something they can actually afford or they could probably be spending their money in in better ways. Just putting that out there. Yeah. Well, I mean, also brands at times react adversely to that if they become too closely associated with what they see as the hoi polloi. Uh, in the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, when members of what is pejoratively described as the Chav or Chav demographic, C-H-A-V, when they started uh, sort of identifying themselves with certain clothing brands or certain fashion brands, uh, the brands took a hit to their reputation. They didn't like it. And in the past, if we want to uh, 
point out some of the uh, systemic discrimination involved in this industry. Brands didn't like it all the time when a uh, hip hop artist, for instance, would say, you know, I love this cologne or I love this blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, money talks and takes the ascendant spot in any capitalist conversation. So, for instance, the uh, manufacturers of Maybach cars uh, may not have initially loved the fact that they were getting mentioned by Jadakus or Rick Ross, but uh, when they saw the numbers and they saw the visibility, they said, okay, yeah, all right, cool. Uh, the cool people like us, and that helps us sell cars. This it certainly is, worked yeah. out for Hennessy. Certainly worked out for Hennessy. Excellent example, Matt. And these are other. There are other. Um, well, Gucci is the big one. Gucci is a big one. Uh, there are other uh, uh, other things. These conversations happen with the most uh, the most valued brands in the world. And again, like anyone who knows the strange history of the Coca Cola company. Uh, uh, the importance or the value of a brand is sometimes very difficult to quantify. Like what's, what's the actual valuation or price you could put on Nike or Adidas. But this, this conversation, we're saying it money is first, but it also factors in more than money uh, that, that drives it. So what, this gets very interesting when we forecast the future of fashion right now, we can categorize the world uh, in terms of the the biggest apparel markets. And we've got pretty solid information on that. They're in the following order. Um, first, the European Union is number one. It's got the largest apparel market. And that's, uh, some people might take that, see that as a little unfair because remember, the European Union is a organization composed of 28 different member states that are all their own countries. So it's it's kind of like it, it, it's kind of like comparing a team for a team sport to a group of individual players because second is the United States and then third is China. Uh, given the current economic pandemonium, that may very well change uh, in the coming years. Uh, in 2017, which is probably the best, like the most recent solid numbers we would have here, uh, the fastest growing global market in apparel was sportswear. It was growing at 6.8%, which doesn't sound that huge until you hear the next statistic, the size of the global apparel market. Uh, in 2015, it was $1.3 trillion with a T in U.S. dollars. Uh, by this year, and this number came before McKinsey really understood there was a, a, you know, a global pandemic coming, which we kind of predicted in our Superbug episode years ago. Anyway, long story short, 2020, the market is supposed to likely rise to $1.5 trillion. So while 6.8% may not sound like a huge number, 6.8% of $1.5 trillion certainly is. And a lot of this is because, you know, if you look at if you look at the planet overall, we're seeing the emergence of an act of, of a true middle class in a lot of the world that historically had a um an incredibly unequal domestic population. You know what I mean? Where like one to 5% of people controlled the majority of wealth and most other people were consigned to poverty. Now more and more families are saying like, Hey, I want to get myself some, or my loved ones, uh, some, some more uh, luxurious high end clothing, you know, that ties in with diet. I want to eat more meat. I want to go out to eat more. Um, this this pattern is most uh, apparent in the region of the Asia Pacific. Uh, there's a four percent rise in the apparel market there overall. So if you wanna if you wanna make a lot of money and you're a um, a global fashion conglomerate, start selling sportswear. Sell it in Asia, make it overpriced, and uh, just watch the money roll in. You know, it's a really great point that you made earlier, Ben, about that report coming out showing the 1.5 trillion uh dollar the increase to 1.5 trillion dollars um it does feel as though the disruption the economic disruption from this pandemic globally in the fashion industry may not be fully felt for a little while 
just because of if you think about the way money flows in these from you know uh designing to manufacturing to the actual selling of these products right and you know it's being affected in the fact in the factories where these clothing you know where clothing is being created it's being affected in people not being able to go to a retail store the retail stores closing themselves all of the online shopping that is occurring but lack or less of a need for a lot of the fashion items so man it's just it's going to be pretty brutal i think um but we just don't have those numbers yet because we're not in the future yet. However, the McKinsey State of Fashion uh, made a report in 2019 that, I don't know, seemed to be looking forward to 2020 with some serious prescience. Uh, we've got some quotes here. We predict that 2019 will be a year shaped by consumer shifts linked to technology, social causes, and trust issues. Uh, alongside, I love this idea of trust issues. Alongside the potential disruption from geopolitical and macroeconomic events. Let's unpack that. that, that there's a lot going on in that. Trust issues? Potential disruption, indeed. Yeah, you know, that's, that's the thing. You, uh, you don't have to uh, think McKinsey is necessarily heroic, to admit that there's some there's pretty good research here. Uh, the this report ha, you know is necessarily vague because they're they're trying to uh, prognosticate a little bit and they're you know at this point they weren't able to say this specific chain of events will occur, but trust issues they're clearly describing you know what what is occurring in the U.S. and abroad today. I mean, look, it's what? It's July 17th as we record this. The The kingdom of Iran is going into an internet blackout due to protests that are sweeping the country. You might have read about it on Reddit. Maybe, maybe. But there's so much happening. People do trust their governments less because it's it's not because there's uh, it's not entirely due to foreign disinfo campaigns. It's also because the average voter knows more about how the sausage is made, and it's a gross, disturbing story. So, we so McKinsey knew. That's so crazy. They knew in 2019 what would happen. I can't wait to read their 2020 report. Uh, if we're all <laughs> still, still a little, little light reading there for you. yeah, it, it, it's uh. just a blank page. Says it's 2021. Good. It's just emoji. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's just it's just like in all bold caps. We're mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it, the report also it mentions it in that quotation there, but the report also examines the role of technology in a couple ways that matter for this episode. First, that there will be um, ever more sophisticated logistics programs like a, a lot of the big companies you know from walmart on down uh they prize themselves on their uh supply chain logistics and then of course data analytics which are part of every single modern business now it doesn't matter what you're selling uh you want to know everything about the person buying it and then waste reduction efforts uh waste is a huge problem in the fashion industry which we'll explore in a later episode probably and then really Jets, stuff that sounds very um, utopian and, and Jetson sci-fi level here, like drone delivery. Why go to a store? We'll just, we'll send you that, uh, we'll send you that Louis Vuitton drone. But that's all good, right? All this sounds like a step in the right direction, yeah? Yeah, I mean, yeah, hopefully. It's, it's definitely, it's, um, it's definitely what we would want to happen uh, not to, for, I hate this phrase, you guys, but it's definitely what every stakeholder would want to see from the companies creating the stuff to the people doing the actual work of manufacturing it to the people buying it at the other end of the chain. The report also lists the growing demand for sustainability and this part, greater interest in transparency in supply chains, along with a growing desire for those established brands, those Nikes, those Adidas, and so on, to participate in some way in political matters, which might be surprising to some of our fellow listeners, uh, because, you know, the uh, factions of traditional media will sometimes give a, or in the past, they would give fashion brands 
some uh, some heat. They would give them some smoke if they said, you know, uh, we support one movement or another. I'm not going to say, you know, I'm not saying it's going to go as far as like we at Nike uh, we we at Nike support regime change in Iran or something like that because that uh, that won't help them sell shoes. As soon as it helps them sell something, they care, right? Uh, when 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 there was an opportunity uh, to affect you know the second quarter profits by uh, performatively allying oneself with uh, a cause du jour, then of course they're all in. That's money. You know what I mean? Just do it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, when the zeitgeist uh, turns with a um, large enough majority of the public opinion, right, that's when it happens. That's when you can see every company coming out uh, with some kind of support for a movement. And we've seen it pretty recently happening. Companies that you may not expect to see from uh, see that from, mm -hmm. and at the at the you, you know it's that old saying: at the heart of every great fortune lays some sort of crime. No, honestly, that's that's a little bit of a broad brush statement. You know, uh, some people and in some institutions uh, accumulate wealth because they do a good job. It doesn't necessarily mean they broke the law or social mores or taboos, but that doesn't make the statement entirely untrue. Unless you've been living some sort of troglodytic existence and you never watch the news and you've only wear worn clothes that you made yourself – you you have pr the odds are you have heard about the ongoing concerns regarding the dark side of the fashion industry it's very true just to jump back really quickly to that concept of a great fortune constituting at some point probably some kind of crime or a crime at the heart of something like that hey, we've talked about it at length before in this show but just to reiterate the concept here is that a great fortune generally is not something that is built within a couple of years. It takes time to build money up, and then that money continues to accrue more money, and it grows and grows and grows. The concept there is that if you go back far enough with something that would be considered a great fortune, there's probably some act or some process within you know, creating a product or pulling something out of the ground, like a natural resource, where there was – something terrible that happened to other people in order for that fortune to be generated. That's all we're saying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like the uh, Kennedy dynasty, a political dynasty here in the U.S. Uh, pretty solid evidence that uh, they got their start in bootlegging and they later sort of diversified into politics. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's not to say that bootlegging was the absolute worst crime ever, but it was certainly illegal at the time when it was being done. And real quick, I think we buried the lead here. Troglodytic? <laughs> oh, <laughs> an ama finally. Amazing word. Amazing word, Ben. Finally. Oh, I, you know, we didn't write it, but yeah, it just living like a troglodyte, living, it means cave dweller. It's just like the, uh, it, it, it's the fancy version of cave dweller. It's the overpriced upmarket fashion version of cave dweller. Love it. But, you, you know, speaking like of the fashion industry, of the idea of, of crime, the dark side of the fashion industry, we're, we're not talking about the stories or the uh, sometimes sordid lives of hotshot gurus of design or influencers. And we're not talking about the cabals that meet to determine what, quote unquote, hot color palettes and products will be for the given year. But those cabals exist. It's crazy. There's a there are groups of people who get together every year and uh, decide what will be in fashion or cool. And when they do it, <laughs> part of how they part of their process is to try to make it seem like everyone just organically agreed, which is ridiculous. I, I wonder if that happens in other industries. I hope it happens in other industries. I hope there's like a cabal for um, thinking what the silliest thing would be. I'm hoping there's podcasts. Like a, yeah. Yeah. Is there a cabal for podcasts? How do we yeah, get in that room? I think it's called iHeartMedia. <laughs> <laughs>
Is just it? Well, we, we don't have the best track record then. No, no. <laughs> you, you guys, I, I just something occurs to me. Can we dub this episode the dark side of the loom? That's mm-hmm. cool. That's pretty okay. cool. Just, just, it's, a, I mean, you know, just submitted for your approval. And things are about to get dark. Uh, these harrowing tales of the people actually making the clothes, you know, the ones actually operating these looms, these massive machines creating the fabric, uh, the stories that get kind of filed away uh, in some back room, um, you know, or some uh, step along the way of this absurdly clandestine, you know, meandering supply chain uh, from the factory to the fashion shop show um the runway um to the retail rack or you got your high street boutiques in in london Uh, i I love i love the idea of the high street i've never been but i always think of it as being like an elevation thing like the high street is literally like somehow higher than the other streets but that's not true they just call it the high street because it's uh just like a main street in the united states so what's the secret story behind all of this stuff and we'll tell you right after a quick work from our sponsor Uh, Pretty sure it's a high-end fashion retailer. Here's where it gets crazy. The secret story of the fashion industry, or one of them, is slavery. Not being hyperbolic here. Not exaggerating, not embellishing, not chasing a sensational headline. Slavery. At this point, it's a stretch to even call it a secret, although it is definitely something apparel industry giants historically have not, and in several cases still don't want you to know. Uh, There's a 2018 report by the outfit GlobalSlaveryIndex.org where they found that the fashion industry has not just involvement with the practice of modern slavery, but huge, gigantic economic impact on it. It's the fashion industry's existence and the way it moves now is very, very good for the slave trade. Uh, Specifically, a quote from this report finds that the fashion supply chain funnels more money toward modern slavery than any other industry besides technology. And, And why is that important? Just to exacerbate this, in absolute terms, there are more slaves alive right now, enslaved, than at any other point in modern history. Yeah. And a lot of this trouble arises when you've got, a, uh, let's say, a company based in country A, let's just say the United States for this example, and all of your manufacturing for the products that you're creating that you've designed, it's being done in company B, which is halfway across the world somewhere where the rule of law is very different in that country. And the laws in country A and B do not apply to one another. So then when you're trading and making deals and setting up contracts, it just becomes a very different system. Right. And it's there's a lot of trouble in enforcing law in country B when you're in country A and you know there's a crime being committed or if you know you're in country B and there's a crime being committed in country A. It's just a it's a tough thing to deal with. The big problem here is that many of the companies who are operating in this way to get cheap labor in a different country are aware that these problems exist or it can it can be assumed that they are aware and and it's important to say you know we're talking in absolute terms when we explore modern slavery uh, but it comes from a couple of factors you know one we have to we have to be objective and say part of it is due to the overall rise of the human population right uh, that turns out actually that's probably going to be a fad global fertility rates are are crashing uh just because there are more people enslaved in absolute numbers, that doesn't mean the percentage of people enslaved is necessarily at an all-time high. Uh, For more information on this, please do check out our earlier episode on modern slavery. But there's another part of this, and I think it's what you're you're speaking to here, Matt, uh, the the interaction of of the fashion industry. It's, It's not a 
altruistic affair, right? It's not a nonprofit. It's not a not-for-profit. It is, it is clearly a profit-driven uh, endeavor, this unending search for cost-cutting, to streamline supply chains. These are the kind of things that could be considered sort of the Star Trek-like continuing mission of these global enterprises. Doing a, I'm the Captain Kirk of inappropriate jokes over here. And we, we don't know how many slaves exist, right? Like, that's, that's terrifying. We don't really know. Yes, we, we do not know the exact numbers, but we do have some estimates that we can point to here, and it's harrowing stuff. It's estimated there are probably somewhere around 27 to 30 million people who are enslaved right now. And there are other outfits that have estimated that number to be higher than 40 million. And that's across the entire globe that we're talking about. A lot of the people who are enslaved are thought to be in India. There are a couple other countries that also have a large number of those who are enslaved. We're looking at Russia, China, Nigeria, Pakistan, Ethiopia, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, Burma, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. <sighs> and, you know, that's really unfortunate to hear that. I mean, for somewhere between 27 and 40 something million people that are enslaved right now. Um, it's ugh. crazy. I mean, and, and before the episode started, we were talking a little bit off mic and I was like, Ben, so when we say slavery, are we talking about just super low wages? Are we talking about like some kind, you know, obviously there's prison labor, but I would consider slave labor uh, in, in its own weird way. Um, and it's, it turns out there's this weird gray area and it's sort of like a combination of a lot of these things sort of mashed up. It's really kind of hard to track. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, you just call it what it is. It's my modern slavery. Yes. And I was um, in no small way distressed to learn that since the time we recorded modern slavery and since the time to the time that we're recording today's episode, the average cost of quote unquote buying a human being is still very, very cheap. It's very low. Today in 2020, according to uh, nonprofit watch groups, sites like moderndaycrimes.org, in multiple sources, uh, the agreed upon average cost, again, this is to buy a living human being, is $90. That's less than, just for comparison, uh, that's less than a lot of people's monthly cable and internet bills. That's much less than, say, a... um, a PlayStation or a game console of choice, we are as a society saying that what one PlayStation is worth four, maybe the new one's worth five human beings. It's really disturbing. So yeah, we're, we're consider us available to ruin all your future casual get togethers and cocktail parties. Uh, But, but, but to your point, Noel, uh, we do need to, acknowledge that there is there is a blurred line here. There is a, a, a gray area, a liminal space in the difference between very highly exploited labor and out-and-out slavery. There's a definition that the CNN Freedom Project used uh, that, that we think is, is, is a good lay-of-the-land definition for what we mean when we say slavery today. That's correct. Uh, They define modern slavery as, uh, quote, when one person completely controls another person using violence or the threat of violence to maintain that control uh, and exploits them economically. Um, and they are not able to walk away. That threat of violence could on this is this is me uh, could also be a threat to their family in any way, holding them hostage uh, and forcing them to do work against their will. Yeah, we see a lot of times that this kind of thing is enforced by one or one person or one group holding on to the traveling papers essentially of another or a family to where they cannot leave, where they do not have any money to leave um or to gain access to other means of transportation or escape. Um it's really rough stuff. Mm-hmm. And and it's 
it's all true. This is not conspiratorial theory. You may see headline chasing reports that focus on the many, many people that are tragically forced into uh, sexual exploitation. But looking at the statistics, for what we know, uh, many more people, the majority of people, are forced into manual labor of some sort. And, of course, it would be naive to not acknowledge that the people forced into manual labor are often also exploited sexually by uh, those in positions of power. This manual labor includes stuff like the production of textiles, fabrics, uh, in some cases, the, the final step in manufacturing of clothing that consumers around the world purchase. Like literally, the people who take something that was made uh, in a generic factory and then sew on the name brand label. Uh, and then that goes to someone in a store somewhere, uh, and they might buy this uh, these shirts, these pants, these socks, these shoes, etc., and wear them on a regular basis for years without ever knowing the um, the disquieting genesis of 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 that of that piece of clothing. It's modern slavery, and it's not. You know, we're focusing on the fashion industry, but longtime listeners, you know, this has popped up in other cases, right? In in uh, mining, it's everywhere in certain uh, agricultural goods it's everywhere yeah, lots of food production yeah yeah and uh and people have even been you know s- enslaved in all but name here in the u.s to assist with harvesting crops right so slavery is a link in numerous supply chains according to the u.s state department Slavery, just by itself, is a $30 billion industry, and it's an industry fueled by lack of transparency in unregulated production and illegal work practices. It can take several forms in the world of fashion. Yeah, you got to wonder, too, like, I mean, the paper trail of all this, it's not like, you know, it, 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 it incriminates these companies as like, OK, we went out looking for slave labor. It's just kind of part of a bigger system, right? I mean, you know, where the, it ends up, it's like a byproduct of just this hunger for cheap labor and cheap manufacturing. And we're complicit as a country. It's not just fashion. I mean, it's like we crave this. Therefore, there's a market for it, right? Yeah. And you never know who is going to be doing what for that piece of clothing you're wearing because you cannot see that supply chain when you go pick something up and buy it. You can't see it. There's no way to do it right now because there may be an enslaved person harvesting the cotton that became that shirt you've got on or the the pants that you're rocking right now. A An enslaved person may have spun up all of that fiber, that cotton into yarn that created that thing. There may have been an enslaved person that actually did the final stitching on that shirt and thousands of others that ended up in that retail store that you usually go to. And it's going to be really tough for you to prove that that's happening or to look at a label in some way and figure out if that was, uh, if that happened at some point along the way. Ben, is, is this the same kind of stuff that we used to hear referred to as sweatshops back in the day? Yeah. Yeah. Sweatshops, uh, sweatshops can straddle the line there. The typical idea of a sweatshop is uh, very underpaid labor, if not outright slavery. But to go back to that idea of the liminal space, you could say that the fashion industry walks a fine line between slavery and exploited labor. You could say they, I guess you could say, if, if you want to be cutesy about it, that they thread the needle. The thing here is, you know, the problem of enforcement. What is legal or accepted in one country, such as a very low wage or very long working hours in unsafe conditions, might be illegal in the country where the ultimate end product is purchased, right? So this means that you can circumvent laws because remember, corporations nowadays are often more uh, more powerful than states or governments. We're moving through that uh, evolution of ultimate, uh, ultimate social power here. Most of the interactions between fashion industry and modern slavery come from, as we said, global supply chains and slave labor sort of infiltrates that fashion industry in myriad ways in the supply chain, like the the different ways, the different avenues you mentioned, Matt. Um, there, this also goes into 
it goes into uh, underage labor, child slavery. Imagine if you're a kid uh, born in extremely disadvantaged circumstances, and you and your parents get an offer for a gig that pays pretty well. And you think, well, higher education is not a possibility for me. Uh, I have to find a job to support my family. Uh, like in, in very real terms, I have to be able to buy food or medicine. So I'll take this job. I'll travel to this factory. They say they're going to give me an education as well. This will be a step up in life for me. But then you're in coerced factory labor and you are kept in debt bondage. Debt bondage is something that's going to be familiar um to many people because it takes many forms. This is an explicit form of debt bondage. Uh, but you could also say uh, debt bondage is, uh, well, debt bondage is a way of an employer um, bilking an employee out of compensation by adding a bunch of incurred cost, right, that they quote unquote recoup before the person doing the actual work sees a penny. This will be familiar to any musician, who has ever worked with a record label, right? That you could make a pretty strong argument that something similar happens with a lot of, especially historically, a lot of recording agreements, right? You get the money deducted for studio. What, I mean, how does that work, Matt? Oh, I, oh man, I don't know. I've never actually worked with a label before. <laughs> but yeah, it's just anyone, anyone attempting to keep you on the hook um, for a debt that you owe by adding more and more to that debt. It's a story that we've heard more and more about over the past 10 years or so with regards to human trafficking when someone pays or or needs to pay a group several thousand dollars, let's say, to be moved from one country to another country, and they have to do it secretly. When the people arrive in the destination country – the people that brought them there say, well, yeah, you still owe us this money. How are you going to pay us back that money? You have no money. And then that uh, that group would then force them to do things such as labor and other terrible things in order to pay off that debt. But of course, it's accruing interest. So you never really are able to get out of debt and you just are essentially stuck in bondage. Yeah. And if we look at the that 2018 report mentioned by Global Slavery Index, $1.27 billion worth of garments uh, were at least what they say, what they phrase as at risk of including modern slavery in their supply chain. They're imported annually by the G20. That's the group of nations that accounts for 80% of the world trade. Uh, in the, in this industry, if we look at the demographics from what we know of people who are laboring in bondage or slavery, 71% of the population are thought to be women. So the question, what are people doing to try and stop this? The kind of good news is they're trying to do some things. We'll tell you more after a word from our sponsor. <laughs> So we're back. Uh, once again, legislation rears its head slowly and inefficiently and imperfectly, but we're, you know, we're getting out there. Uh, various Western countries have attempted to address this crisis. Make no mistake, it is a crisis. It is a conspiracy through legislation. In 2010, California passed an act requiring large companies to publicly disclose their efforts to address slavery and human trafficking in their supply chains. The UK did the same thing or similar thing in the Modern Slavery Act of 2016 that said businesses past a certain size have to publicly disseminate the actions they've taken to combat supply chain slave labor. Uh, and, and that met with some positive force, but we can only really describe it as a good start because that legislation had problems. We don't know how effective it was. We don't know to what degree it was enforced. And, you know, the California law only applies to California. There are 49 other states. And the really messed up stuff is happening in the uh, U.S.-controlled regions that aren't even considered states. Uh, and then there's the, there's the big bank conundrum, right? Like after a, certain, after a certain point, 
of profit, right, and economic heft, then any kind of uh, a lot of financial punishment is just going to be folded into the cost of business, right? You're a bank, you do something crooked, you get your uh, you pay the fine. Yeah, Yeah. you, you pay the fine. You just pay the fine. It's not gonna. It's like if you got a twenty dollar ticket for legally parking, you could tell yourself, "Well, if I parked in a parking deck, it would have been twenty five dollars." And 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 again, and again, like this cost of doing business mentality is such an American like staple, like of capitalism, like this idea of you know deregulation or of like even the idea that we can you know why would I pay taxes? What, like, why would I? I'd be stupid to pay taxes. You know, I, I, I should do whatever I can to use these loopholes to best serve my interests as, as a business person. You know, the president says that very unabashedly because it's considered like a badge of honor to be. I'm smart. You know, if I wasn't smart, I would be paying taxes, you know, and it's the same thing with this stuff. You know, uh, these leaders are like they're looking out for that bottom line. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, just it's obviously beating a dead horse, but it's so clear. And yeah, they just yeah, we'll pay the fine and we'll just roll that into the cost of doing business. It's a problem with loopholes. You know, uh, there's there's a conflict of interest all too often people who are making the laws and this is not just a U.S. thing. This is an every. This is an everywhere thing. People who are making the laws often have a vested financial interest in carving out loopholes that take the teeth and claws from those laws that render them in some way ineffective, such that they simultaneously appease the concerns of voters, at least for that news cycle, while also maintaining the economic status quo. I mean, here's a story that the Jedi won't tell you. If you live in the U.S., you've probably seen that Made in USA label on various products. The idea here is that you see that, you buy it because you're supporting your domestic economy, and you're also buying something that conforms to the labor and employment laws of the U.S. But we found an example from back in 1993 that shows just how meaningless that phrase can be. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, back in 1993, which was, by the way, 27 years after that old uh, Made in USA label started making the rounds on pretty major brands, uh, the New York Times ended up, t- they exposed a scam that had been running for a long time. So let, let's just talk about this. Um, there were a ton of industry giants, Aero, Liz Claiborne, The Gap, Montgomery Ward, Jeffrey Bean. There were a ton of them. They were all using, oh, Levi's, by the way, also included They were all using the Made in USA label. But here's the thing. They were actually manufacturing clothing in a place called the Northern Marians or the Northern Mariana Islands. Now, this is a really interesting case, and it's exactly that kind of loophole we're describing here, where the Northern Mariana Islands are not a United States state. They're not a U.S. state, correct? They are a commonwealth, technically. That's where they are. It's, uh, you know, they're islands that are out in the Northwest Pacific Ocean. And the, the problem here is that in this commonwealth, the same rules don't necessarily apply that if you were a citizen of the United States. It's, it's a weird, again, a loophole situation where there are some similarities, but it's not the same thing. The workers there in the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, they were often migrant laborers from other countries, specifically from the Philippines and China and other Asian region countries. They would live on site at these factories where manufacturing was occurring. They were living in dormitories that were just terrible. They were working ridiculously long days and they were making $2.15 an hour, which was almost exactly half of the guaranteed federal wage that the United States would uh, would give to anyone working at that time in 1993. It's, uh, it's really crazy. The worst part is that if those factory workers like spoke up, guess what would happen? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have to guess because we have stories from the people who survived this experience. They were booted off the project. They were shipped back to their country of origin. And additionally, the wages they were due were confiscated. So that's I think that's an example of the, the liminal space between exploitation of labor and slavery because you had someone who was able to hold that over you. If you complain, 
we're just not going to pay you. And in 1993, at the time of that expose, clothing from the Northern Marianas only made up about 1% of the $29 billion in clothing imported into the U.S., but it accounted for up to 20% of the clothing sold worldwide by some large American companies. And, and now you have to think, like if you're the average U.S. customer in 1993, how in the hell are you going to be aware of that? How are you going to know? How are you going to know? Uh, and, and while we're being fair, in many cases, especially in the past, it's not as if these companies all got together and pulled some sort of Monty Burns thing, steepling their fingers and like, yes, support the slave trade. No, because the complex supply chains here make it possible, plausible, in some cases, even probable that many companies genuinely were unaware of their complicit participation in slavery. They see that they get a great price on cotton, right, and sign a, a several-year contract for that. And then that goes to a different company that has a factory where the cotton is processed. They sign a contract for that. And then that goes to a different company, and so on and so on and so on until it gets to a store. They didn't do due diligence, and performing due diligence on every aspect of a supply chain has to be, if we're considering financial punishment for breaking the law, a cost of doing business, then due diligence should logically also be a cost of business going forward. Will that make clothing more expensive? I mean, yeah, probably. I, I would imagine. Yeah, no, like I, I felt like maybe I was misusing this term when I've when I've used it in the past, but I just looked it up and I think it applies. The idea of the banality of evil. Um, you know, there's a philosopher named Arendt who um, referred to the Nazi war criminal Eichmann um, as being an example of the banality of evil that he wasn't inherently evil, but just shallow and clueless. And that's kind of what this this all is. You know, these corporations maybe they're not inherently evil, but they just don't care enough. To- to like know what's going on and it's just a byproduct of like the whole capitalist system that yeah you know just a couple of bad apples right this is there's yeah sure there might be a little slavery in there but it's mainly fine so who cares right people like problems that are removed i mean to uh, on the other hand of that point right yes this this will probably make clothing more expensive you can buy uh you can buy sourced clothing that is uh, described as sustainable in terms of impact on the environment, in terms of their wage and employment practices. And yeah, it tends to be more expensive. But on the other side of the coin, since we're talking about money, on the other side of the figurative coin here, do you want to live in a world where you in some way are supporting the enslavement of human beings because you save five to 15 or whatever bucks at the register? Do you want... like? Are, we have to ask ourselves, are we comfortable with this arrangement because it's happening in a way that we cannot immediately see? If you had to go to the, the people who are enslaved and you had to buy that stuff directly from them and look them in the eye and you know acknowledge like life sucks and people are terrible, but I am ta- I am agreeing that it's better for me because this is eight bucks instead of 12. I, I think a lot more people would be a lot more uncomfortable with the yeah. idea. Or, or food processing. That's a good example, right? People will eat something because they don't have to watch the cow get slaughtered. They don't have to watch the bolt gun shoot into its brain, you know? So you're at a remove. Therefore, it's easy for you to just kind of absolve yourself of any responsibility. You know, I'm not saying that killing cattle is is bad or is in any way equivalent to slave labor, but it's a similar, you know, kind of uh, that that remove is very similar. Ben, you've painted a picture in my head where I'm imagining a small booth where there is let it's let's say it's in India because that's where a lot of the modern slavery is occurring or you know any other country where it's occurring there's a small booth where there's one person sitting behind that booth and there's a big rack of designer fashion clothes behind them and uh when a customer comes up picks out picks out a piece of clothing hands the person behind that booth let's say $120 uh, U.S. for this piece of clothing. And that person behind the booth takes that money, 
gives you that piece of clothing that they made by their hands, hands that money to their employer, which is standing right next to them. And the employer gives them back half of a penny or, you know, one cent in order for all of the labor, the actual human being that created that thing gets, you know, whatever minuscule fraction, if anything, for creating that piece of clothing for you, the end user. It is just, man. Yeah. I, you know, the thing is, I, I know this can come off as sanctimonious. So we also have to admit it is very difficult to, it, it is very difficult for us when we're buying stuff to be aware of just how many horrible uh, injustices or shenanigans, if you want to be glib, go into this, right? Like how the demand for attention and the demand for research is so uh, unending nowadays. Well, like even, even in the course of this show, there are at least three other hidden sides of fashion that we have not covered in this episode. One, we didn't cover the uh, rampant sexual exploitation in the modeling industry, which is very closely related to the fashion industry. Two, we didn't cover the, um, to me, hilarious story of the deciders, those real life committees that get together every so often and decide what is or isn't going to be hot in the, in the subjective shifting world of taste. And we didn't cover the pollution and the waste which was, you know, what set us off on this path to begin with. So we have more to we have more to dive into in future episodes, I think. Certainly. We we haven't even talked about the psychological damage glo- globally that the fashion industry has done for the, you know, self-image of women and men across the world. Um yeah, it's a whole there are, there's lots to go over here. So what do you think about all of this that we've discussed today, the ugly side of this giant industry, of the things that are on your body right now? Unless you're listening to this, you know, commando or naked or however however you like to listen to the show. I mean, we don't judge. Whatever you want to do. What steps can be taken, do you think, to actually stop some of this? Not to, you know, have some kind of loophole legislation out there, but what can actually be done? to change this whole thing. We want you to write to us if possible. Uh, find us on, on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, all those were mostly conspiracy stuff on Instagram or conspiracy stuff show. If you don't want to do that, you can give us a call. We're one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Leave a message and you might get on the air. You never know. Yeah, a lot more opportunities for that these days with the uh, with the weekly listener mail episodes. So definitely hit us up. We love to hear from you. You can also join our Facebook group, which is a lot of fun. Here's where it gets crazy. Just name me, Matt, Ben, uh, Super Producer, um, Paul, Mission Control, Decant. There's some little tidbit about the show so we know you're a real human person uh, and we'll let you right on in. Um, great way to interact with other listeners, share memes, all of that. And also, please, do us a solid. Go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a nice review if you enjoy the show. It seems like a small thing, but it actually goes a long way to help people discover the show um, and to help fight the trolls and on here's where it gets crazy honestly fellow conspiracy realist if you just make a dumb laugh and i chuckle or even just sort of uh breathe air out of my nose a little bit more aggressively then boom mission accomplished you're in if none of that quite bags your badgers there is always one way you can get in touch with us no delay no waiting no lines All you need is some avenue to the internet. You can reach out to us 24 hours a day, seven days a week at our good old-fashioned email address, where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.